Welcome to More Than Miles, a podcast created to look deep into what it means to be a runner and endurance athlete. Our episodes are filled with real stories from real runners, elite to the everyday athlete. We bring together healthcare providers, athletes, and dive deep into topics that matter most to runners. I'm Dr. Kate Mihavik Edwards, physical therapist, author, athlete, and complete coffee addict. And I'm Dr. Casey Sinders, physical therapist, athlete, and pun expert extraordinaire. We are so passionate about changing running culture to improve the health, wellness, and fulfillment of our endurance athlete community. And we hope that these conversations inspire you to focus on putting your health first so that performance and PRs can follow. Now let's get to the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to More Than Miles. Today, we have Dr. Chris Stanley on our show. He is an author, researcher, and sport and performance psychologist, as well as a mental performance coach. He's an associate in research at Florida State University and has previously been full-time psychology faculty at institutions in North Carolina and Florida. In addition to his university work, Chris has been involved in the USA track and field since 2014, and he also works with us uh, with the Atlanta Track Club Elites. Chris is is just full of sports psychology wisdom and mental performance and training wisdom. And we got to talk a lot about a lot of different topics. I think the big one being um, mental rest and self-care and uh, how it's important to train those skills like just like we train our bodies. Uh, we talk about pressure and how uh, athletes can deal with that from multiple different angles. Um, so this, this one is really enjoyable. We get into the weeds of mental performance. Uh, we kind of jump right back right into this one because Chris just had so much to say. Um, so lack of general introduction, but please enjoy this conversation with Chris Stanley. I appreciate it because when you talk about uh, advocacy and and education in, in this field, my background is not as a mental health practitioner. Those preceding terms matter. It's sport and performance psychology. It's not clinical psychology. It's not health psychology. But oftentimes athletes, whether recreational or elite athletes, when they are exposed to a psychology professional related to performance issues, um, and that's kind of the the entry point, so to speak. That's what you know brings you together. You know, we're here to focus on on that. That's that sometimes is more palatable uh, for them. It sometimes makes us a bit more approachable uh, than someone with a clinical background. Uh, where if they are being referred to some to a clinical psychologist, and they know that sometimes they take that as some kind of informal diagnosis right off the bat. It's like clearly something clinical or or pervasive or problematic is is apparent to someone else. Um, but with with uh, performance psychology, that's not necessarily the case. We're focused on performance issues. That's not saying that that I and and we speaking on behalf of other people, I guess, that have my role, we have a, a degree of, of mental, not an academic degree, but a, I guess a level, a degree of mental health literacy, because we don't view athletes, we don't view performers as as performers kind of in a vacuum. And it's, mm-hmm. it's difficult to not, when you're trying to understand someone's athletic self, performance self, it's difficult to disentangle that from some other, you know, personal and psychosocial aspects of of their life and certain settings and so we do unpack that that comes up it just so happens once in a while if if i do detect that maybe some mental health issues are uh, or or concerns are being expressed you know we do have those okay i think what you just said is is important can we just we just stop for a moment and talk about that and and you know we do assess that we, we even as performance based um consultants we can uh still kind of help understand we can still help refer out uh, we don't have to cease our performance work with them we just want to be sure that they are also getting the support they other they need in, in perhaps a mental health capacity and so we still do need to pivot um, be able to uh, recognize signs and symptoms behaviorally, verbally. Uh, we need to pivot in certain cases. We we need to help refer out 
um, help them find a specialist, help them find a good fit. It's not always, when I got out of a university setting, I found out it's not always as simple as saying, um, we'll just go to the counseling center on, on campus. It gets, <laughs> it gets, it gets a little stickier when you're out in more of a, a professional or out in the uh, community. We feel like you, when you make that pivot, sometimes I feel like I'm almost, almost pivoting to being a, a case manager in a way sometimes like do you you have health insurance let's see what it covers in terms of counseling or clinical psychology sessions mental health practice let's see what that covers okay well then you get past that it's like okay what are the what are your interests what are some preferred characteristics for a provider would you like them to specialize in a certain issue or technique do you want face-to-face do you want remote so it, it quickly right and so it's it all of a sudden you, you pivot your case manager, you're kind of walking with them a bit. And that's 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 a, a skill that even as a performance psychology professional, you need to be able to to pivot to and support that. Support I mean, the client, support the athletes in that way. I mean, honestly, Chris, I feel like we're doing that very similarly across mm-hmm. the board every single day we're at a point where, okay, well, this is not something that we actually handle. This is not something that is in our lane, but we know a lot of different people that can handle this particular issue that is impacting your health and your recovery. So let's go through that list and let's figure out who we can find that might work best with you. And I think the further along in your career you get, the more often that happens. Yeah, I would agree with that. And and maybe as part of um, maybe as you get further along in your career, maybe you have a um, a wider uh, set yeah. of clientele. So you just have a lot more exposure. Maybe you have over time developed, a, begun to develop a better rapport or develop the skills that allow you to develop a better rapport with with clients and athletes. So they're more willing, able and willing to disclose to you you know, certain elements of their personal life, including that related to physical and and mental health issues or concerns they have. And so, yeah, I agree. As time goes on, it's just you you put yourself in a a position, you've built kind of networks, you've built a skill set where where you are maybe exposed to that, counter that a bit more. It's a, um, but, but you're right. It's a lot of the individuals in sports settings, you have, you know, training partners, you have coaches, you have um, athletic trainers. You have just a variety of other support individuals that that support athlete athletes in in a variety of ways. And it's just it's like all of us can be in a position where we where we do what we've been talking about thus far. And there's um, it reminds me of an analogy, not an analogy, a um, acronym. That's the right. Uh, but it's mental health first aid gives uh, an acronym of ALGE, uh, A-L-G-E-E, uh, for like non-clinicians to be able, what what they can do in situations where there are like mental health crises or situations that are presenting themselves. And and the first one is you assess for, for harm and self-harm. And you can do that observationally or I guess – Verbally, they they could state something to that effect, or or again behaviorally, you can observe that they seem to be acting in such a way that could cause a harm to themselves or or others. Um, and if that's the case, you know, you you call nine one one. I mean, many times even professional clinicians, if if that's the case, I mean, you you call nine one one. There's also nine eight eight now, which is more of a mental health crisis response and when you're going out of country might be getting off on a little bit of a tangent here, but when you're going out of country, you know, it's important to look ahead and see what the local version of 911 is Mm -hmm. and and just be equipped with that simple piece of information. And for that first bit of algae, for that A, assessing that, you know, you're just, we need to stabilize this. We need to keep this person safe and let's get some trained professionals in that can help assist with that. But then you move past that if you've addressed that, or if there is no indication of, of any type of harm, you can, all of us can listen, right? We can listen. And, and often the, the, the term non-judgmentally is in there, but just you know, what's, <laughs> yes. if, if they're comfortable to share, which is challenging sometimes, I think, but in certain spaces, but, but we can listen, we can 
give reassurances, kind of moving along the acronym now, but we can give reassurance that you're going to be okay, you're in a safe place. Um, and then the E is for encouraging, right? Encouraging self-care and encouraging professional help. And that last part is is kind of where you can pivot sometimes and make referrals, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but that first one is is related to self-care. And I like how they, they have two E's in there. It's not just encouraging one or the other, but it's both. And, you know, one of the best predictors of what's going to work for an athlete in any social or performance circumstance is what has worked before. What have you done before? And so in kind of unpacking that a little bit, what have you done before that's helped you calm down, that has helped reduce anxiety? What have you done before to help you manage these other emotions or feelings or circumstances? Um, and, you know, that's fluid, that's ever changing. So sometimes it just doesn't stop there. If I'm having this conversation, it's not like, what did you do before? Okay, we'll do that again. I, I don't know, that wouldn't make me an effective practitioner. But sometimes you have to, sometimes different athletes have different, a different array of pre existing skills and experiences. And some are, some struggle to come up with things that have helped before. And, and maybe the things that did help before to manage certain emotions or circumstances don't seem to be working because things have changed, right? You think about an athlete that's gone from a certain level to maybe a, the next level, right? There's a, there's a new array of expectations and pressures associated there. So maybe the, some of those pre-existing skills and strategies don't, don't work anymore. And so maybe we need to think through what, what else could we do? Or maybe we try different formats of things they've, they've done before. So maybe it's time to get creative. But yeah, so sometimes there's that self-care piece, which is critically important. It should be part of anyone's, if not day-to-day, week-to-week. I I get it, days string on where I haven't done anything that's for me, right? Uh, <laughs> but it should be it, sh- it should be aspirational. It is best practice to be integrating self-care and examining that and re-examining that. But then, yeah, that last piece is encouraging getting professional help. And so this is... This is where you are mentioning that you pivot sometimes dialogue with athletes. Uh, this is where I, I'm talking about I pivot and we start to do that walk. Again, it's not just free counseling on campus. It's like, let's let's try to reduce as many barriers, even if they're informational type barriers. Let's make sure it's something that's not going to be a huge out-of-pocket cost. Let's see what's covered, what's not. Let's see if there's waiting lists. It's really frustrating sometimes to see the type of waiting list that, you know, an athlete wants help now or yesterday, and you call a clinic with them and it's like, we'll get you in for an intake, but just so you know, the waiting list is like three months. It's like, oh, that's it's kind of devastating. Yeah, yeah that's, it's, that it's really be very troubling devastating. to say, okay, it's like, okay, well, let's, let's try someone else. So, but anyway, remember algae. Um, A L G double E. I know that's not the way the. <laughs> it's not the, how it's spelled, the, Chris. Mar- the maritime. What is it? The, <laughs> the nautical algae. Is spelled, the algae. But... Yeah, I'm going to think about algae <laughs> a little bit differently now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. So if I have to, everyone else has to as well. That's right. <laughs> Um, well, Chris, I've learned so much from you, and I love listening to you talk when we're collaborating with um, our athletes, and it's been so wonderful to have you as our consultant on the mental performance side. So I'm I'm like really excited to get to actually ask you um, pointed questions so that I can learn even more uh, today. So you mentioned self-care already, and I think so many athletes hear the word self-care, and they either don't know what it is, or they think it's like putting cucumbers over your eyes and like lying down in a spa or something. I don't know. There's so many ideas of self-care. So I'm wondering on how, about how you talk with athletes who are like, go, 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 push, push, push. Um, how do you kind of enter into that conversation with athletes? I often, and I've used this term in in some of our, our meetings before, because it's one I dialogue or bring up often. I actually, in kind of the spirit of self-care, I talk about mental rest with my athletes. And, and athletes typically... Right. There are some that go, 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 and they don't understand rest. They don't seem to appreciate or understand rest. Like sincerely, I'm sure you've been exposed to those athletes, but many times athletes do, they understand training cycles. Uh, and the, 
idea is you you stress, you you train, you have these stressful periods during a day, you have stressful periods of um, you know weeks and months, and you build and you're stressing your uh, cardiovascular systems and muscular systems. You're stressing, you're elevating, you're continually testing and, and kind of pushing limits, so to speak. But within those cycles, within a day, you need a rest period. Within a certain weeks, you need pullback weeks, you need rest periods, and certain over months as well. And they seem to really appreciate that. And and one of my questions sometimes, like when you do have an off day or an, a rest week, I mean, are, are you still, do you still find yourself kind of, you know, ruminating, you know, worrying about things that you didn't accomplish or things you could otherwise be accomplished? Is being still and restful is it kind of awkward for you? I, I, you might appreciate that even as as professionals. Like I, I certainly I should be doing something <laughs> right now. I'm sitting here and 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 I don't have a scheduled meeting. What? But but just worrying about things and and oftentimes the answer is like it's like yeah. Even if I have an off day, you know I'm still worrying about things. I I view that off day as being a time to just that's things that I've pushed back. So I have a day off on, I don't know, Saturday or Sunday. It's like, let me push, but I'll, I'll get all these other tasks accomplished on that day. And all of a sudden the rest day or rest period doesn't become traditionally restful. And, and what we're going for where we kind of start, what we start talking about is, is do you have those restful spaces again during the course of a day? And maybe it's unrealistic to think you're going to get that every day, but but during a course of a, a week, at least, we have a couple periods we can be strategic. We can plan ahead. You know, this is your 30 minutes. This is your 60 minutes. Can we try to have a genuinely restful period, kind of that low cognitive activity as well? So, it's, again, um, putting ourselves in a space where we're not doing anything physically, but also cognitively things are are lighter as well. And and you have to be strategic about that yeah. sometimes. And sometimes we have to plan ahead and say, okay, let's get these things off your plate leading up to then. That's one of the the largest, I guess, inhibitors of mental rest is you have unaccomplished tasks. And I know we can't say, okay, you've been meaning to paint your house. Okay, go paint your house between now and Sunday, and then you'll you'll be setting yourself up well. But but let's let's try to get let's let's manage our time. Let's try to be aware of what we need to accomplish. Let's let's take some steps. Let's organize ourselves. Let's have a again a strategic approach to set ourselves up for if not that weekend, the weekend after, or three weeks or two months down the road. Because I want you to be exposed to that mentally restful space. And we we think about we think about accomplishing tasks and trying to get things off off your to-do list, so to speak. But we also talk about settings as well. And do you have, do you have places that are, are kind of sanctuaries uh, for you in, in a sense, even if it's a room, even if you have training partners you live with and you don't like them, do you still have a, and they stress you out. Um, do you at least have a room you can go and close the door? I mean, is that room, is it still full of, of triggers that, that remind you of, of, things of, of training of athletics and so we just we kind of look towards that we we look at setting ourselves up um to be in spaces and to have some of that that me time and what happens often is when you athletes often don't advocate for their own time a lot of us don't so no one's going to block that off on your calendar unless you do no one else is going to knock on your door and say you know casey kate are you did you guys block off your me time this week it's like no that's you're you're your own advocate for that kate has done that to me actually i have <laughs> okay well good i'm i'm pleased to hear that uh because you know you you need to do that and and once you do that i think that's a good first step but then let's let's forward plan and let's set ourselves up for for success. And then, okay, so then what are you doing in that space? So maybe we've lobbed off some things off your to-do list. Now we maybe we're trying to identify a space, but now what other things have you done before that you find enjoyable? Some people it's mindfulness, right? I could give, I could talk about that for a while. I don't want to, but on the other end of that spectrum is mindlessness. 
And I've actually, I, I joke about that. I, I think I've got burnout on mindful talk at, at a certain space. And I said, well, where, what place does mindlessness? And that works in some spaces too. I'm not completely averse to that. I'm okay with, although social media has its, has its negative aspects for some athletes in some cases, it's like if, if that works for you, if you want to close yourself off in your room, dim some lights, and just sc- come in and out of scrolling or social media or watching just mindless stuff, let's do dog it. Videos. Let's start there. Oh, all the dog videos. No, no. I dog watch videos. so many dog videos, and I send them to Casey. It's yeah. un- it's unbelievable. <laughs> and so, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's actually shocking. And the other day, I was so tired. I was laying in bed, and my husband comes in. He thought I was asleep. And I just look at him, and he looked at me. He said, more dog videos. I said, yeah. yeah. There's this there's this um, personality on social media. His name is Rockstar, but I think the <laughs> that um, doesn't sound good already. Well, I think the like all the vowels in Rockstar, are like an X or something. I can't remember what he does. He accepts videos, like animal videos, and he'll like voice over. And it is so oh, incredibly funny. hilarious that. But yeah, that's uh, that's what I. If you ever if you ever hear me see me looking at the phone and just kind of uh, giggling and laughing. I might be looking at, at him, but, but oh yeah. God. So, so well, anyway, Casey, you, you, you asked that question. I feel like I'm getting into a bit of a monologue here at times <laughs> of being less well, conversational. So it, I apologize for that. It's okay. And, and the thing, Chris, that was really interesting about this idea of mental rest, I remember on one of our phone calls, you said something about playing video games. So it's the same idea as social media, right? And so I have, I have this cringe factor in my mind about social media and video games. Like I do not let my son play. I hate it. I think it's awful. And then you said something on a call about, well, sometimes people just need to play video games to be mindless. And I, and it like just, my whole head exploded (laughs) and I didn't know what to do anymore. And then I came home and this is like, you didn't know because you were just talking about an athlete and I'm like, come home. And I'm like, Brian, who's my husband. I'm like, maybe it's okay if Andy plays video games sometimes. Like I just (laughs) had this whole breakdown of all of my beliefs that day. (laughs) Well, and that's why I have to be careful what I say uh, sometimes because I, I, it's not something I encourage like parentally or familially either, but some people have, that is the relationship that they have. That is kind yeah. of part of a, almost a, a coping skill that they have. But the thing is you, and Kate, I understand this from a, a familial or parental yeah. perspective. It's just, you are, and you know, well, you're opening yourself up to um, a space where there's just going to be a lot more monitoring involved in terms of content, in terms of time, um, and maybe where I was coming from with that, maybe I had just spoken to an athlete who was a, a gamer or, or into video games. And, and I, th- where I just, I try to come from with athletes. I'm, I'm not going to be the practitioner or the person who says like, no, that's not a good use of your time. Uh, right. You know, I, maybe, really maybe there are limits dead. we need, but I, I'm not going to at the outset, <laughs> you know, cause it does serve that purpose for some. I just um, recognized that for the first time when you said that, because that's, again, not to bring him up several times in this call. I must be thinking about him a lot. But my husband, he's like a person. So I don't love TV. I'm not into video games. I don't really like social media except for dog videos. And he comes home and he just needs complete mindlessness. He'll want to play a video game. And I get so mad every single time. But that, and or like he'll want to turn the TV on and just then he falls asleep and it makes me crazy. And yeah. so that day in that call, I was like, okay, maybe it's okay for a little bit of time. Not for me. And I'm not really giving up my beliefs about my child, but I did think, okay, I can cut him a break sometimes. Yeah. And <laughs> and you're right. It's uh, use your, I, I trust your discretion in that. Uh, but yeah, cause you will be opening yourself up to others, other, other space, but yeah, some people even derive, um, benefit you said you're turning on the tv some people even if it's a show episode they've seen countless times before it's just it's kind of some background noise there's for some children there's there's a certain uh security in in knowing what's coming next on the screen it's like we've seen this before we know this we i can i and and it just it gets them in a very mind 
type of mindless, low cognitive, you know, restful state. And it sounds like your husband uses that to his advantage to to rest, to sleep, to to nap a bit. So his wife's not nagging him. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think it comes down to, if the, you know, if we're trying, if the person's trying to escape and push away their problems and just not think about it, not address it. And then they just come back to the same world, you know, that they, yeah. as they left it. So like, I think about this in terms of, well, therapy isn't relaxing by any means, but it helps you get to the root of the problem. So eventually you feel better and you have better coping skills and things like mm-hmm. that. So it's like, yeah. Finding the root of the problem versus yeah. just utilizing mindlessness to shut your brain off for a little bit, right? So I think there's a little bit of a duality there. Yeah, absolutely, Casey. You're you're on target. And you know, rest, what we appreciate about physical rest, it seems, is that uh, you know, during those restful stages, there's actually recovery and repair, and you actually come back a bit stronger. And mentally speaking, that's what we're going for as well. Are are you giving yourself these adequate mental restful places because if you do you actually come back refreshed rejuvenated and you'll actually come back you know um stronger mentally in some ways there was an article years ago not that many years ago but uh, it said resilience the title was resilience is not about how we endure but how we recharge and it's just like yeah it's Resilience isn't just let's hammering, hammering, hammering physically and mentally over time. The picture of resilience and stories of resilience, they're, they're, they're longitudinal in nature. And it's just like, no, these are, these are a bunch of moments. And in between these moments where we feel like we're stressing our systems, you know, we're, we're also resting it. We're also recovering and so we build strong bodies by these training cycles, including these restful periods. We build mental strength. And if we want to call it resilience, you know, you can. Uh, but it's it's about how we help ourselves recharge. And, and I guess part of my underlying message with some of the stuff I've been talking about is, is we need – I like athletes to be active agents, to be involved, to – to um, be their own self advocates for these restful, rejuvenating periods, and it's not just about sleep. We know we need that, but there are also times in your day, your week that's also kind of mentally rejuvenating, mindless, whatever that looks like. It doesn't have to be in a a safe space that we help set up in a room or whatnot. There's a variety of other spaces, contexts, activities that that athletes may report, yeah, that's, that's worked for me before. I, I like that. Um, okay, well, it's, is it still working? And if not, what could we do? Could we creatively think about how to um, reintegrate that if it's something you've just gotten away from? Uh, or can we think about maybe trying it in a new modality or a different place or a different time or something like that? So, but Casey, you're, yeah, you're right on when you, when you note that. So Chris, let's pivot here just a little bit and talk about the idea of pressure. And I'm sure that you talk to a lot of your athletes about pressure, especially recently after everything that's been going on um, and the timing in the in our kind of world, there's been a lot of pressure building up to many events. So what are some strategies that you use with your athletes who are feeling that pressure? And what do you kind of suggest to people who might be in that situation? Sure. Yeah, pressure is, it can be a perceptual thing. And so you're right, you know, Worlds is coming up next week, starting next week, travel is happening for the World Athletic Championships in Budapest. And you think about elite athletes and you're like, oh, what what incredible, incredible pressure that is to that world stage. Well, you might also temper that idea a bit. Well, they have been exposed to a lot of high pressure performances and experience. So they actually may have some level of degree of coping skills and strategy to to handle what is a high level of pressure. And I guess my point with that is that when you look at, take yourself out of that developmental level or that competitive level, there's first-time athletes, middle school level, that just stepping out into that athletic 
arena or course or track for the first time at their level with their uh, skill set, coping strategies, mental skills, that might in some ways be felt and perceived as intensely for them as some of these elite athletes are experiencing when they're on a world stage and screens are in front of them and you know, millions of spectators and whatnot. So it's a perceptual thing. And so as, as a practitioner, you, you have to appreciate that and I think be ready to address that across kind of a developmental or competitive spectrum. But I also mention it's perceptual because there's a few, I guess, prongs or, or ways to approach pressure. And, and I've already mentioned the perceptual one. And we, now I'm speaking on behalf of man, humankind, I guess, but we can be very critical on ourselves. And we talk about, we talk about self-talk sometimes in this inner dialogue that we have and 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 we can be very hard on ourselves and and in a in a performance or pressure based context you know telling yourself that i you know i i can't do this i'm not ready i don't belong here right you know these are things that do bubble up even at higher developmental or competitive levels they 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 bubble up and so from a perceptual level we do unpack self talk and we do there's cognitive restructuring work you can do with athletes it it's typically best performed over time right identifying the kind of self-defeating thoughts and kind of uh, attacking them um i also and and disputing them and sometimes that involves you know journal work or log book uh, a, a log book and you, know, you you find the defeating self-talk the um irrelevant illogical self-talk and you also try to dispute that and you revisit that and you try to give them something cognitively or perceptually to kind of punch back with so to speak uh i also like to talk about fighting feelings with facts and so uh leaning into past and recent and past performances even if they're within a practice setting or scenario in the absence of fans or tv or prize money or anything like that i mean and i, I am talking a lot about track and field and running right now but but coaches often have an intimate knowledge of of performances that are having in in practice so let's let's talk about that again it's it's nothing anyone beyond us and maybe your coach is going to know about maybe some training but let's talk those are those are facts you those are those are times those are performances let's make sure we 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 bring those to the surface and remember those because those are physiological facts of things you did and so when you start having these these doubts about being able to to handle the throws of of performance in any you know situation or scenario let's let's revisit that as well so I, perceptually you know and this is kind of at this level you can also understand pressure in terms of the the physiological experience that the athletes having you know pressure it's it's the stress model here's here's the task at hand do i have the do i have the skills and skill set to handle that if yes all right that's good but if not it's then there's this the stress reaction right and that can look like a lot of things it can be elevated heart rate it can be kind of um elevated you know cognitive speed and capacity ruminate thoughts it can there can be elevated breathing uh respiration rates as well and so physiologically we can work on again mitigating what that pressure or what that pressurized experience is that stress experience in the moment is we're not going for deep relaxation but athletes being uh skilled such that they know uh breathing techniques or relaxation techniques that can maybe move that needle a bit in a more desirable direction uh you can couple those breathing techniques with either uh like tactile or physiological cues or even mental cues a lot of effective breathing techniques have counts associated with them um one of my favorites is just a five and a half second inhalation and a five and a half second exhalation which if you do the math that's 11 seconds per 
I guess, respiratory cycle, which would come out to about five and a half breaths per minute. So it's, it's a five and a half rule of breathing. I don't know, not rule, um, idea. <laughs> uh, but there's other, there's a variety of other counts that can be customized. And so what you're doing though with those counts, you're also occupying your, your mental space with something simple, something relevant, something unharmful at the very least, something neutral, rather than giving your, and it's occupying space that otherwise is there. If you think of your mental space as kind of this canvas, you're occupying space that otherwise is available to go in a variety of irrelevant, illogical, not helpful directions. And again, some of those self-defeating thoughts, self-talk, you know, whatever it may be. Physiological cues too, when you talk about diaphragmatic breathing or deep belly breathing, or even just trying to follow the breath, you know, through the nose, nasal passage back out the mouth. I mean, that's all physical, physiological cues. Again, you're occupying a mind space that otherwise could be taken up by something irrelevant. So breathing is always, it's a harness, right? It's, it's a harness of other physiological processes it's time well spent to uh, become attuned with a breathing pattern and technique, uh, to become attuned with uh, the type of diaphragmatic deep belly breathing that can stimulate the relaxation response. And again, we're not trying to take a nap in a lot of performance <laughs> contexts. We're just trying to move a needle slightly in a more desirable direction. And, and having that sense of control, moving that needle a bit, recognizing that you are lowering your heart rate, your respiration rate. Maybe, again, there's physiological cues related to breathing, but at least giving your, yourself a chance to return to relevant performance-related cues. So, yeah, that's two of them. And again, I'm getting into a monologue here, but there's the perceptual, there's the mental stuff, there's the physiological. There's, other, there's also like psychosocial or social pieces as well, that relate to pressure. And we, we brought up social media already. Um, and, and again, I'm not here to um, get on a soapbox and talk about the, the evils of social media. I already said, I, I'll, I'll scroll mindlessly for a while as a place. Uh, but athletes often do report the negativity that can come from social media. Elite athletes in particular are often in a space they, they need to they have branding. They might even have branding obligations or contracts. They need to get out there. They do have, you know, it's it's related to image, their their social image. There's there's importance to that. There's relevance. They need to do that. But sometimes negativity, pressure, irrelevant stuff can come from certain spaces in social media, and, and comments come up a lot. If you ever seen Wreck It Ralph, the second one, it's just like don't read the comments and he, he read the comments and that it's just, but yeah, there's, there's certain spaces sometimes social media. So we might, we might work sometimes on trying to reduce that, not like cold Turkey, let's stop social media. That's not practical, but where are those spaces that you tend to, that get you worked up that, that seem to contribute towards negative states that it's um and, and we do maybe sometimes the same with, with people, um, I, I don't. I'm not in the business of cutting people off from family or friends or anything like that. But you know, maybe there is ways to to mitigate and be mindful, especially leading up to critical performance of of who the conversations they're exposing themselves to, and the relevance there is whether it's social media or your social, social surroundings, your circle, social your circles, social circle, or your yeah. Teammates. That external dialogue has a way of becoming like our our internal dialogue as well and, and contributing to pressure. So again, is some degree of pressure good? Absolutely. Uh, it can actually heighten in performance, but, but how are we managing that perceptually? Do we have coping skills and strategies that help us redirect ourselves when we start going down a, an illogical, irrational road with, with our ability to handle that pressure? Do we have skills to help manage some of the physiological stuff? Can we be forward thinking with, with the way that we manage our social surroundings going up to performance? So, so yeah, those are some of the prongs. There's kind of like a, the physiological kind of bottom up, maybe there's the perceptual 
top down and then there's like the the social the the outward towards in and uh, maybe prong is the wrong analogy there but it was just different avenues different ways you can approach it and i think chris too like we work sometimes if you think about it from top down or bottom up i think that we probably from a physical therapy standpoint and even in our clinic work from that kind of bottom up that diaphragmatic breathing getting mm-hmm. into that nervous system calming it down from that I mean, we have plenty of athletes that I can think of a few um, really high level athletes that we've worked with in the past that sometimes they just come in and that's all we do because Mm -hmm. that's what they need at that point. And it's still, you know, physical from a physical aspect, but it is tapping into the physiology and bringing them out of that kind of heightened nervous system state. Yeah. And this is an analogy, the physical training and practice and mental training and practice analogy fits perfectly they and you you can appreciate that you need to put the time and effort and energy you need to make that time to develop physically you can't walk into a to a strength coach or a coach or athletic training office say i I have a competition this weekend and i just i have these gaps and these can let's can we address that can we make up for that and these between now and then these next few days or whatever it's like it's like no and and mental skills can be the same way you need to be forward thinking about it and you know we can have some conversations we can try to introduce some simple things if i am meeting an athlete for the first time just because all of a sudden there's a perceived gap or weakness and they need help before a a critical competition or high performance situation or event but ideally it's it's you're working on things you're you're taking the time you're practicing on them you're becoming attuned to physical and mental states so it's easier for you to tap into them when you need them and you know that that can look like a lot of different things based upon athlete needs but the idea is you you build you experiment you make time you work on them so you have them when your your time is constrained, right? You have them when your time is constrained. And when you have them, you have access to those and you can employ them when also it's just you out there, right? I can't be there. I might be in the stands. I might be in a med area. I might be somewhere else, but I'm not out on the track with you to talk you through things during the course of, you know, as you're approaching an event or during it or immediately after. It's like, no, we need to be set up to to utilize these skills and tools when you need them and when you're on your own. It reminds me of a, a phrase that I've heard. I don't, it's not mine, so I don't, but I don't know who to credit correctly, but you train for athletes, you train them and then you trust them. Mm. Right? So you work with them on to, to prepare them as best you're able, and then you, you trust them to employ those, those skills in relevant scenarios. I always love it when our guests give me the exact title that I need for the uh, podcast episode. Uh, yeah, absolutely do it. Just <laughs> I don't care who you credit to. Just say not Chris Stanley. I don't want. I don't want to do like a podcast plagiarism or anything. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, Chris, this has been really great, and I've learned a lot actually from this. Even though we get to talk to you every single week, which is kind of nice. Yeah, no, this was incredibly helpful, uh, uh, enjoyable uh, for me as well. And, and again, I hope I didn't go off on too many monologues. Uh, it's supposed to be interactive. <laughs> That's all right. We're just we're just going to title it Chris's monologue. No, I'm just kidding. It was <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> I shudder to think if I ever do that when I'm meeting with an athlete and it turns into <laughs> an hour of me talk. I think I'm much more mindful when it's an athlete. This is a little bit different feel. So oh, this is the Chris. I indulged. Can... I indulged in the monologue. Yeah, we we loved it. And I think loved hopefully it. everyone learned a lot just like we did. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your time with us. Yeah, thanks, Chris. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening today. We are so happy that you're here. If you enjoyed this conversation, share it with a friend. Even better, share it on social media because sharing is caring. And the more people we can reach, the better. Another way you can help us out is by leaving a review on Spotify or Apple Podcast. So give us those five stars and tell us how awesome we are. Really, we love to hear how awesome we are. To support our work financially, you can also join our Patreon squad at patreon.com slash more than miles. 
uh, where for a few dollars a month, you can help us keep the show going and growing. This season is sponsored by Fast Bananas. Why buy multiple subscriptions made for everyone when you can have one specifically crafted for runners? Fast Bananas has online yoga classes, strength training programs, meditations, recipes, communities to ask questions, and so much more. Check out Fast Bananas at fastbananas.com or follow them on Instagram at fastbananasrun. Don't forget that training is so much more than miles.